train spirit of life come unto me Our call to worship. God is the hope of all ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. God visits creation to water it, blessing its growth and providing its people with grain. The pastures of the wilderness overflow, the hills gird themselves with joy. Let us worship the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, so that we too may be called as sowers of the kingdom's harvest. And our opening hymn is We Gather Together. God of love, whose patience humbles us and whose touch can heal us. God of hope, whose promise sustains us and power upholds us. God of eternity, who calls each of us to be true disciples. Transform us through your spirit and empower us to serve you this day and all days. Amen. So our theme conversation is a little bit lengthy this morning, but I hope you will hang in there till the very end. It's called Beanstalk Jack. The last time I presented this to a church, a grandma came up to me and she said, could I please have a copy? I'd like to read it to my grandchildren. So it, it comes with some kind of underlying authority. We read in the book of Samuel, chapter 16, verse 7, that the Lord does not look at the things we often look at, the outward appearance of a person, but the Lord looks at the heart of a person. Well, here's a modern twist on a traditional fairy tale. 
adapted by the author Carol Howe, and I think it illustrates how God looks at each of us. From a tiny child, Jack was taller than the other children of his age. You know what it is like when you're different. It feels a bit odd. You don't feel as if you belong. Sometimes you feel as though you don't fit in. Jack's hair was a lovely reddish color, but he didn't like it. It was unruly and wouldn't lie flat. His mother wetted it every day, much to his embarrassment, to try and control it. He was a bit clumsy too, and none of this was helpful for him. Well, his mother and father, who didn't have a lot of money, grew vegetables in their garden to sell at the gate with a notice that said, leave money in the small pot. The trouble was the factory that employed nearly everybody in the town had closed down when the old man who owned it had died. Lots of folks did not have a regular job. It was hard for most people. Well, Jack grew out of his clothes so quickly that his mother often jokingly said to him, I'll have to put a brick on your head to stop you growing. I really can't afford to keep buying you new clothes, Jack. No wonder the children call you Beanstalk Jack, for you grow as quickly as my stock bean. Jack often had trousers up past his ankles, and he saw other children, and they were always staring at him. He wished he had just one special friend. He amused himself a lot of the time when he wasn't helping his parents with the gardening. He loved to climb trees and imagined he would climb up to the sky one day. There was one very big tree in their yard in which the branches were too high to reach. Jack had the idea of planting one of his mother's beans at the foot of the tree to help him climb into the branches. Then, he said, I can look over the wall. Well, next door was a huge, massive house with a wall around it and big double wooden gates that seemed to open by magic when a huge black car with darkened windows drove in and out. Nobody had ever seen the driver clearly, but the children of the town, they called him Mr. Big. And rumors were that he was a giant that lived alone and with a very nasty temper. When the gates opened, if any children were nearby, they would run to the trees surrounding the high walls and hide until the car was out of sight. Sometimes they dared each other to knock on the gates and the sound of a dog could be heard barking. It sounded like a mammoth beast, its bark was so loud and deep. Wandering as usual on his own one day, Jack saw that his bean, it had grown in just a little bit into a strong, tall plant and it had entwined itself around the trunk of the large tree. He decided to climb up into the branches so that he could look over the wall that it stood by. Wow, he was amazed. He was seeing stuff he could not believe. There was a swimming pool, there was a swing set, a big ball, a lot of hoops, and some balls of different colors in a row. But what was so amazing was a rideable model of the car Lightning McQueen, the star of Jack's favorite movie, Cars. He leaned out of the tree to see more, and horror of horrors, he fell into the garden. A big dog came over and sniffed him. Jack was terrified. The dog gave a few barks, which brought a giant of a man out to see why the dog was barking. Jack eyed the huge man with fear. He had a large white beard that stretched down to his waist. His hands were huge. His head was covered with a large black hat. From where Jack lay in the ground looking up at the man peering down at him, he was frightened and wondered if this was what giants actually looked like. Why, who have we here? A visitor, Hector, he said, patting the dog. What a pleasure it is. Maybe he will be a companion. Let's go inside and have some special visitor cakes. Jack was scared and confused and wondered how he could get out and escape. But the old man gestured to Jack to please follow him into the big, beautiful house. And once they were in the house, the man asked Jack to sit in a big, comfortable chair and asked in a very soft and friendly voice, Are you all right, my little friend? Well, this was the first time anyone had called Jack little or a friend, and he liked that very much. It took no time at all for Jack to realize that this man who was called Mr. Big was actually a friendly and caring person who told Jack 
that he was in fact very lonely with no real friends. He and Jack compared notes and discovered that they had a lot in common. Both were unusual, different, and wanting friends. Mr. Big took Jack on a tour then of the house and it was soon very obvious that many things needed attention. It was an old house that needed many repairs. He explained to Jack that all the toys and the pool came with the house when he bought it a few months ago. The former owners of the big house had three children. People answer my ad for help always sounding interested in working for me, but when I tell them where I live, they make excuses and never come to do the work. He sounded so dejected. Jack felt sorry for him, but in spite of that, he laughed a little and explained that everyone in the town was a bit frightened of him. Jack then said, everybody wonders about someone they cannot see, so people begin to imagine what it is that is invisible to them. When the big gates are closed, they hear loud barking. Nobody can see through the dark windows of your car. Everybody imagines scary things. However, wait until I tell them about you and how nice you are. I will tell the children about all the toys and games here. He told Mr. Big about the townspeople and how many were poor because they had lost their jobs when the factory had closed down. I know lots of people who would love to come and work for you and do your house repairs, he said. What's more, I know lots of children who would love to play in your garden. I know that they have not seen the kind of things you have here. Can I ask them if they would like to come? Well, Mr. Big was absolutely delighted. Of course, he said, I would be only too pleased to have people in to play. Since I was a child, I've always felt I was on the outside. Now I can invite children and their parents to come inside my property. Jack was so excited and so was Mr. Big. Jack asked him then what his real name was. Charles, he said. Charles waved goodbye to Jack, who ran down the road through the large gates to spread the good news and to give out lots of invitations to play in the lovely garden. Well, said Jack's mother when Jack told her how kind Charles was, it just proves that what is on the outside doesn't count. It's what a person is on the inside that matters. Well, our story concludes with that evening, Jack's parents walked over to Charles' house and notice now that the gates were not closed, they were open. They walked up to the main entrance of the house and rang the doorbell. Charles answered within seconds and welcomed them into his house. Jack's mother said, welcome to the neighborhood, Charles. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving Day. Could you please join us for Thanksgiving dinner? Charles accepted the invitation and added that after dinner, the children could come and play in his garden. Our worship continues with two scripture readings from the Psalms and from 2 Corinthians. The first reading is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens, and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. By them your servant is warned, 
In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. May these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The second reading, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 15. Generosity encouraged. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. This is the word of the Lord.
If you just saw me changing glasses, um, those are actually called musician's glasses, and they help you to see the music. It's always nice when you can read the music. I would like to make a statement concerning the theme of today's service. All across our vast country this morning, the label Thanksgiving Sunday will be used. Throughout this message, I will be referring to my father and his influence on my life concerning being thankful. His strong belief was that there can be no gesture of thanks without the ability to forgive. For him, being in a thankful state could only be accomplished by having relationships that were grounded in forgiveness. Throughout my life with my father, his philosophy on living was to maintain a clear and open relationship with everyone, void of any bitterness or resentment. Now, I would imagine that on the walls or shelves of your home, there are a number of framed photos of family, past and present, and likely close friends or even past neighbors. There might even be photos of special friends that were established in the workplace. And very likely there are photos of pets that have been loved as great companions. Does any of this make sense? Well, in my home there are the usual framed family pictures. And then there is what I am about to show you, a very special and unique member of my family that was a major part of my father's life. It is not a person, it is not a pet, it is the HMAS Norman, an N-class destroyer operated by the Royal Australian Navy. It was my father's home for three years during the turbulent years of the Second World War. Launched in October 1940, the ship served until 1945 in the Indian Ocean, East Indies, and Burma. Now, I happen to have the picture with me, and you can see a small example of it on the screen, but I'll let you see an even bigger example. And I'm going to go for a little walk, if that's okay. Well, some information about this amazing vessel. The ship had a displacement or weight of 2,550 tons when fully loaded. It was 109 meters long. Propulsion was provided by three drum boilers connected to geared steam turbines, which provided an astonishing, and this I find is amazing, 40,000 shaft horsepower to the ship's two propellers. This ship was capable of reaching 36 knots or 67 kilometers per hour, a staggering accomplishment when you consider the immense weight of the vessel. Well, the ship's company consisted of 226 officers and sailors. And this I found most interesting. My father would always mention, if fresh water was required while the ship was at sea and not close to land, it contained the apparatus to convert seawater to fresh water. Now, during this process, it took one ton of oil to produce one ton of water. Water was gold. After the war ended, my father left the Navy to pursue a career as a professional accountant. Before his retirement, he rose to the position of a supervisor of a large staff working in a large office space in a tall building in the city of Toronto. Well, it seems like only yesterday I can hear my father saying after a long day at the office, this is what he would say, if only my staff could work together and be a team like my mates on the Norman. Well, what did he mean by this? 
What was so special about the crew aboard the Norman? My father's answer to that question was simply that all the officers and sailors respected each other completely, living their lives together under very stressful conditions with trust and forgiveness, especially forgiveness. On the huge ship, every member of the crew was given a bunk style of bed to sleep on and a locker. And my father was always quick to point out that none of the lockers had locks. There was never any fear of stealing. Arguments among crew members were rare, and if a disagreement came up, the two individuals involved with though, they quickly forgave each other and just moved on. Every new day brought about a spirit of thankfulness. They were so thankful just to be alive. When my father related his experience on the Norman to the office workers, he believed that they had so much to be thankful for. They lived in a safe country, they had homes, steady jobs, and wonderful health benefits. There was so much to be thankful for, and yet instead of being thankful, many employees he worked with could only concentrate on being bitter and angry with those around them. The men aboard the Norman acted as a very unified, unselfish group of professionals. And what happened aboard the Norman on July 9, 1943, proved this without a doubt. My father, early that morning, July 9, 1943, collapsed on the deck of the ship with severe pain in his abdomen and passed out. His mates alerted the captain of my father's condition. The ship's medic was summoned and he quickly diagnosed that my father was in need of an appendectomy right away. Right away, the HMS Kenya, a ship with an operating room, was asked to sail alongside the Norman. While both ships were cruising at top speed, the crew of the Norman placed my father in a quickly manufactured cradle and slung him over to the Kenya. Doctors aboard the Kenya, within minutes of receiving, as they said, the sailor in the cradle, performed an appendectomy, saving my father's life. All of this excitement was occurring while both ships were technically in battle. Now, if, if you look on the communion table, I have some newspaper clippings that my grandmother was able to save, and I've laminated them, and you can see my father and what he went through there, if you like to look at the, at the end of the service. Let's return to my father's office. The biggest challenge my father faced, and I've said this already, each and every day at the office was coping with employees who could not forgive each other. Situations like being passed over for a promotion or a situation where a coworker took credit for what was not their work or competing for some work to be completed in a strict timeline, this often resulted in long-term bitterness and resentment. This complete lack of forgiveness, according to my father, often resulted actually in the employee becoming ill or not doing a good job and in some cases being fired. The situation of co-workers not being able to forgive and move on has prompted an organization called CompHealth to produce a pamphlet for employers. It's called Nine Steps to Achieving Workplace Forgiveness. The entire process focuses on letting go of grudges and being free of bitterness. I believe that forgiveness is one of the core principles of our faith. Jesus taught us to pray that God forgives us as we forgive others. And we read in Matthew chapter 18, Jesus saying that we should forgive someone who sins against us a total of 77 times. The act of forgiveness is difficult to grant or even receive. It is not like you just close your eyes and declare something forgiven and everything reverts back to the way it was before the offense. Have you ever thought you had forgiven someone and then later you feel the same animosity as you did before you made the declaration? You might have to forgive the same offense as Jesus said 77 times. I forgive you and I'm working on continuing to forgive again and again. In scripture, forgiveness is usually talked about using images of balancing scales. 
When there is an offense, the relationship balance is thrown off, and one side of the scale is then weighed down. So until it's dealt with, the relationship, you could say, is out of balance. And I think it's interesting to look at what forgiveness is not. It does not mean forgetting and pretending it did not hurt. Forgiveness does not mean that you don't still get angry about what has happened. Forgiveness does not mean what happened to you was not terrible or even evil. It does not mean that people have the right to use you as a doormat and walk all over you. Forgiveness means that you are not spending your energy plotting, scheming, or punishing. It means that you will make a conscious effort not to let the situation drag you down. It means not to let yourself become spiritually ugly. Jesus talked a lot about forgiveness and how it can be achieved. He states that the first step toward forgiveness is a process that starts with realizing how you have already received grace and forgiveness. That is, if you are going to ever be able to forgive anyone, you first need a larger perspective of how much you have already been forgiven. There have been a countless number of studies by psychologists on forgiveness. Research has shown that the people who are best at forgiving are people who have been forgiven for something quite big. Those who have hit rock bottom and received forgiveness and affirmation of their worth feel that they have been forgiven so much how they could then withhold forgiveness from someone else. Well, in modern times, I think one of the most profound acts of forgiveness and thankfulness for positive things in life occurred in 2012. On December 14th of that year, Adam Lanza walked into Sandy Hook Elementary School and shot students and staff members. After the rampage, 28 were dead, 20 children between the ages of six and seven. One of these children was six-year-old Jesse Lewis. Jesse died standing by his teacher, shouting at other children to run for their lives. Jesse's mother, Scarlett Lewis, following the massacre, forgave the gunman. She channeled her grief into a foundation, the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Movement, to teach social and emotional learning, which she was convinced might have prevented Lanza from committing the deadliest K-12 shooting in U.S. history. Paul the Apostle wrote the following back in the year 48 A.D., I think it clearly explains how we are able to forgive as followers of Christ. This message was contained in the letter he wrote to the Galatians. This is what Paul wrote. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who belong to Jesus Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us have no self-conceit, no provoking of one another, no envy of one another. Well, after the war, my father attended a church service where he rededicated his life to following Christ. He was simply and truly just so thankful for surviving the horrors of war. He was so thankful that he was alive. He had been blessed with the saving grace of God, he believed. Now, on my birthday back in 1976, he presented to me this Bible. And inside the front cover, there is a message presented to Ridley Gilmore, Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and do not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. I think for sure the model for true forgiveness and amazing thanks. Amen. Our next hymn is As Those of Old Their First Fruits Brought Its Voices United 518.
Please be seated. We'll now sing our offertory hymn as the offering is being collected. In the name and in the spirit of Jesus, we bring our gifts to you, O God. Help us to give with them a ready mind, a willing spirit, and a joyful heart, trusting in your love for all of us as your faithful servants. Amen. I would like to read to you a prayer written by Eugene Pickett, and it's entitled, Giving Thanks. For the expanding grandeur of creation, worlds unknown, galaxies beyond galaxies, filling us with awe and challenging our imaginations, we give thanks this day. For this fragile planet Earth, its times and tides, its sunsets and seasons, we give thanks this day for the joy of human life, its wonders and surprises, its hopes and achievements, we give thanks this day. For our human community, our common past and future hope, our oneness transcending all separation, our capacity to work for peace and justice in the midst of hostility and oppression, we give thanks this day. For high hopes and noble causes, for faith without fanaticism, for understanding of views not shared, we give thanks this day. For all who have labored and suffered for a fairer world, who have lived so that others might live in dignity and freedom, we give thanks this day. For human liberty and sacred rights, for opportunities to change and grow, to affirm and choose, we give thanks this day. And we pray that we may live not by our fears, but our hopes not by our words, but our deeds. We give thanks this day. Amen. Would you join with me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, it will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And our closing hymn is, Come, Ye Thankful People, Come. <laughs>
not rely on your own insight. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. For sure now the model that we are here as forgiven people with much thanks. Amen. <laughs>